his uh, name is uh, Nathan Chuli. He's a digital products engineer in anyway. So uh, he has a quite a uh, in depth background in defense industry. Yes, I, I hear that he knows a lot about missiles. Also, been told he has nothing to do with the Navy Army. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, to digital systems, control systems, he, he is very well known. And uh, he's going to talk to us about uh, the wave motion heat management. It's a cloud based condition monitoring solution. So, Nathan, thank you for coming to me. Thanks for sharing uh, knowledge with us. I hand over to you. It's my pleasure. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody um, in this room and uh, everybody who's joining us online to the wave motion fleet management solution. It's a cloud based. Sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, why we have not feedback? There any microphone that is on? Okay. That sounds better. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you together at once that are joining us online. Uh, to this presentation of the wave motion fleet management, which is a cloud-based condition management solution. I'm um, going to begin this presentation uh, by going through the, the agenda for, for this morning. So the agenda for this for the presentation is as follows. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. So the agenda is as follows. Um, I will begin this presentation by just looking, giving an overview of condition based maintenance, what it is all about. And in any case, it is the foundation on which this solution is based upon. Then um, the, the next aspect that I would like to touch on is. The wave motion fleet management solution itself. And finally, um, I'm going to look at uh, the latest technologies um, on the uh, on the uh, wave model management solution. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So we will begin by looking at some of the most common uh, waterfalls that we encounter in the industry. Um, and uh, this is not to say that the list and the numbers and the percentages that I'm showing me, they are exhausted or they are accurate. This is based on a research that was done by someone else. I will give you the link to this research. But um, the, the most important thing uh, that I want you to get out of this slide is not the numbers themselves, but to just have an overview of some of the faults uh, that we encounter uh, in the industry and how we are going to handle them uh, with the uh, cloud based uh, motion management solution. So the, if, if, if you see on the, 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 the PowerPoint presentation, the first um, major, or shall I say the major fault is due to vibration uh, or even very, very false. Um, I'm showing it here as 40% according to this research that was done, but this could be higher. Uh, and then the next one is um, the faults due to stator windings contributing about 38%. And also, this figure is not really accurate, uh, but just give you an, an idea. The next one is um, water contamination force contributing about 10%. And finally, we have the Finally, we have um, force due to electrical overload um, and power quality contributing about 12%. Okay. 
that is standard with four and something that is your right? Maybe. Uh, just make sure. Yes. Okay. So these are some of the. Uh, now I'll give you the, the, the link uh, if you want to have a look at some of this, this, this the research that was done on this. Let's go. Um, this is the link uh, where you will get uh, the detailed information about about this research. In my next slide. Um, I would like to speak about the evolution of uh, monitoring maintenance. And um, uh, in the first picture there that, that you have, uh, we see how monitoring of waterfalls uh, was done in, in the old days. You can see we've got a guy there who would go to the motor with a probe, uh, put your probe on the motor and listen to uh, the vibrations coming from the coming from your from, from, from your motor. In, in fact, of uh, also experience and have experienced people who actually use a screwdriver and will actually uh, put it on, onto a motor and listen to the vibration um, and they tell you that it is accurate. But it's one of the, the ways by which, uh, you know, monitoring was done in the old days. Um, basically. So this, this was done manually um, and you listen to the sound and, and the feeling and um, The diagnostic capacity for this method of monitoring is very low and it's inaccurate uh, and it does not give you exactly uh, the best information. But when you go to the ages up to uh, now, um, this is in some of the methods that, that people are still using today. Uh, that's when we started having electronic technology, but the routines are still manual and that's still, uh, it's, it's really painful. And um, the vibration main measurement is actually based on human expertise, uh, which which means it's, it's it's really not objective, it's subjective. It depends on the human being uh, that is actually doing it because some people are more accurate than others. Some people know exactly where to place the probe to get accurate readings, and it varies from person to person. Obviously, this, although it was an improvement from the previous methods, but with that diagnostic capability, is, is still very low because imagine now that this diagnostic has been done today and after an hour or so there is a problem on the machine so it does not really uh, tell you exactly what is going to happen to the machine in the future and then um, uh, the technology that we're using today um, which is iot based as you can see on that picture there um, you can see some blue lines sort of converging at some point where they are converging there that is actually meant to be um, a gateway which receives data where those lines originate. Those are supposed to be sensors sending their data to the gateway, which then sends that collected data to the IoT platform. Um, this method of monitoring is autonomous, uh, does not need any human intervention, uh, and it's done online. And um, it is, I mean, you can monitor as many assets as you as, as you like. In my next slide, um, I would like to show you uh, also just an overview of the cost of downtime, uh, which is caused by some of the methods of monitoring, which 
uh, these are not like you know the, the, the type of monetary that we would like to talk about. In the face and for the left hand side there, you will see that we've got tangible costs and intangible costs that are related to uh, to, to downtime. Um, and we've got some percentages there uh, on uh, poor insights uh, that um, uh, that cause uh, the, the that contribute uh, to uh, downtime. And on the right hand side, um, that's where we begin to speak about predictive maintenance using uh, the type of technology that we're going to present to you, uh, the MFM te te technology. And uh, below there, you see some of the enabling um, entities of this technology. You've got sensors, you've got connectivity, you've got integration, you've got machine learning, and uh, we've got augmented behavior, uh, which are your visual reports. And all of this is part of the module management solution that I'm going to present to you today. In the next slide, I'm going to give you a, uh, a well, uh, I'll, I'll just show you the, the PF curve. Most of you are probably familiar with the, it is called a prevention failure curve. Um, but ideally, if you look at this curve, you've got um, your, 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 your horizontal axis and your vertical axis, and then there's the curve that goes down and it touches the horizontal axis. Basically, what we are doing here, and specifically with uh, the with condition based monitoring, we're trying to make sure or to try to defer the point at which your curve touches the, uh, the, the, the horizontal curve. Because on the horizontal curve, you can just carry on. On the horizontal curve, what you have is your operational hours and your digital, digital axis is the, uh, the, the health of your equipment. So the, the more you defer the point at which this curve touches the, 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 the operational hours, it means that your asset is up for quite some time. And that means you, you, your production is up and you can generate revenue. I've divided this curve, this curve into, the, uh, into the following uh, divisions. The point D is the point of the design of a machine. Um, and obviously, when you design a machine, you design for reliability, you design for maintainability. The point I is the point at which the machine is installed. And the interval between I and P is the interval between installation and the point at which a failure can begin to be to be detected. Now, in the next uh, window, which says they that says they we are here. This is basically the the window that you have uh, to do something before the failure happens on the on the on, on, on your machine. If you do not do something during this window, then um, you have no time to stop whatever is happening on, to, on that machine. So some of the activities, and this is the window where we are we actually act upon this, you know, for condition-based monitoring. Um, and these are some of the activities that we do uh, during this window to prevent uh, a catastrophic failure on the money machine. So one of the activities that we do today is vibration analysis. We do thermography. We do ultrasonic spike energy. And this is also not to say that these activities are exhaustive. There are some people that do more than this, like uh, you know, some people do oil analysis and so forth. But the point here is to say that this is the window that you have to try and do something on the machine before you get to the next window where you are doing reactive maintenance. Because as you can see, on reactive maintenance, you start to hear audible sounds from your machine, you start to feel the heat, uh, you start to see the smoke coming from the machine. And by the time you see all this, it's too late uh, because you cannot stop the failure. So eventually, the failure occurs and it causes um, unsafe damage and also, um, yeah. In the next slide, I would like to illustrate this, uh, this the need for condition-based monitoring and how helpful it is uh, using the following example. In this example, uh, we've got a machine that has been installed. A machine comes to the idea of for example. And the, the installation phase, as you can see there, there is misalignment. Um, well, some in some places they do not even do um, alignment, you know. So, but let's assume uh, it just went too far ahead. You know, Sorry. Just go there. Now, let's assume that at, 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 at the very point of installation, 
the there was misalignment. And the type of maintenance that we're doing here is called reactive maintenance. That is, you know, you react to whatever fault you begin to see on the machine itself. But now we've got we've got this misalignment. So you run the machine, um, and all of a sudden the machine come, um, comes down, it goes down because of this misalignment. This type of downtime is, is, is unplanned. You didn't, you didn't know that this, 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 this type of problem. So the whole factory perhaps has to go down now. You've got to do repairs. I don't know whether you've got space already or not. So those are some of the factors that you have, you have to look at. But um, suppose you succeed in getting the machine to, to run up again. This cycle will continue. Uh, you will continue to have unplanned downtimes because you basically not having any information coming from the machine to at least know uh, the status of, of the machine. This is costly uh, and in terms of time and also in terms of in terms of money. In the next regime of maintenance, which is preventive maintenance, it's more or less uh, similar to, 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 to reactive maintenance, but in this case, remember, you plan to do your maintenance at certain intervals. Say after three months, you plan to you know, put your machines down and, 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 and do maintenance. But again, bear in mind that when we started off here, we've got this, this problem of, 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 uh, of misalignment. And you have planned to do your maintenance, say after three months, you run this machine, and all of a sudden, you've got a problem again. You've got downtime, and this is unplanned. Because you didn't plan to stop the machine at this point in time. Um, and you, you have to do your repairs again. So it's more or less similar to the previous regime of maintenance. And this cycle can repeat. And the point here is this is costly. Um, whether you want to look at it in terms of money or in terms of, of time, it is, really, it is really costly. But this is where we sit with the condition based maintenance. Right from the very onset, this machine is misaligned. But at installation, what we are doing is we taking measurements or taking readings from this machine, taking data from this machine to monitor its health. So those spikes that you see there um, is actually just to see that we are taking measurements. And um, out of those measurements, we are actually uh, you know, visualizing them as if, 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 if it is orange, as you can see, it's like a warning to say that something is not right with the machine. Because you're getting this data coming from the machine, and if it is red, it says that uh, the machine is in a critical mode, and you immediately need to do something on the machine. If it is green, if the indication of your data coming from the machine is green, then you say everything is okay with this machine. But we know this machine now there's a problem, there's misalignment. So when we measure our data, we start to get uh, this message coming from the machine saying that something is critical on this machine, you need to look at it. You can then plan to bring this machine down before it can go down by itself. Um, then what you have to do there, you, you put it down and you do your repairs. It, it gives you time you know, to do your repairs. And um, after your repairs, the machine runs again, but you still keep on collecting data coming from the machine. And in this case, because you've done your repairs, I'm assuming that the data that you're getting from the machine is, is that the machine is in good health. That's why you see uh, the green dots there. And let's say for some unknown reason now, we begin to get a warning from this machine. Um, it has nothing to do with misalignment because the problem of misalignment was fixed. But this time around now, there's something else which is wrong with this machine. Because we measure the data, we're getting data, real-time data from the machine, uh, we will get warnings to say that something is not right with the machine. Um, please check. And um, we then plan to put the machine down, stop the machine, do our repairs, and get the machine back to life again and running. Now, this is the whole essence of condition-based monitoring. And this is the whole essence of the web motion fleet management solution. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the MFM solution. Um, if there is any slide that I don't want you to miss, it is this one because it summarizes the whole, the whole concept of uh, emotion grid management. We start off at the bottom here with uh, the, the sensor. We call it the photo scan sensor. I will also discuss with you, uh, discuss with you again uh, another sensor, type of sensor that we have. But let's use the photo scan sensor for this description for the time being. 
So the, the models can set some obviously it is sitting on an asset and it is measuring data and it is sending this data to, to a gateway, which sits on the edge of the IoT platform. And um, the, the, the gateway communicates with the models can sense via YouTube. And it does automatic data collection from the from the model scan sensor. And it can store data during off periods. What the gateway does then with this data, it sends it, sends it to, the, to the cloud. Uh, and the other way of sending data to the cloud is for one to download um, an app um, from the app store or from, or from the uh, from the app store. From, from the uh, uh, what do you call it? Thanks. To Yes, and then um, with the app that you have downloaded, you can scan the sensor, obviously within a certain distance from the sensor, about 10 meters from the sensor, you can scan the sensor. Um, you will get your data on, the, uh, on, on your mobile device, and using your mobile device, you can still send your data to the cloud. But again, you can see here, this there is some, uh, you know, I would say this, there's some weakness with this in the sense that the availability of the data on the MFM cloud depends on me going to the sense I'm scanning it. Otherwise, if I don't, which means the other way is actually the best when you've got a gateway because everything happens automatically without human intervention. But with the data now on the MFM uh, cloud, um, what the user can have access to are dashboards. What you see there is basically basically a dashboard. Uh, it tells you the the uh, the yellow and the green, they are just like indicators on the status of your of your of your asset on your machine. If it is yellow, there's a warning coming from there. If it's green, everything is okay. Um, we will discuss later on some of the detail of what you will have access to on the IoT uh, platform. But the basic level, the entrance level that you have access to when you use this sensor is what we call the You will have alerts and notification. You can do alerts and notification settings, which means you can be alerted on the status and the health of your machine. Um, you can, you know, um, do maintenance orders. Let's say, say for example, I'm, I'm sitting here, I've got a plant that is a dead end, and I see this your problem. I can actually send someone right on the floor on the plant to tell them that they must look at this. This machine is a problem. So you can create such maintenance orders. You can also generate unit reports, which can also be sent to you by email. And um, you can also do um, asset prioritization. What we mean by asset prioritization really is that there's some of the machines are really critical machines and you want to prioritize monitoring them than others. Because if those machines go down, it's like the whole plant goes down. So you can create prioritization, uh, prioritizations like that. Now we also have what modules, uh, which are also uh, available on the, on, the, on, the, on the cloud. The first module that you see there is the specialist module. Now, this is the most advanced module that you will have access to. This one, it runs all the algorithms, all the artificial intelligence uh, on the data that has been sent to the cloud. And um, for the first, first 14 days for this particular sensor, it does learning it learns the behavior of the asset, it learns the behavior of the module within the first 14 days. But with data keeping on coming, then it does calculate, um, you know, in depth, the health of, of your model. It even goes to the depth of telling you the conditions of your bearings um, using artificial intelligence and some of the algorithms uh, that, that are available on, the, uh, on the, uh, the, the, this module called the, Model specialist. Then we've got another module. This one is called the uh, the extent module, and it will allow you to obtain data uh, that is on the uh, MFM management platform, and you can integrate this data with your other programs like your SCADA or like people who are in the warehouse who plan for space and so forth. They might actually make use of this data to say that this is the information coming from the machine. We've, we've got the warning coming from the machine. The warning says that the PM is a problem. Then they can actually in advance before the machine goes down, uh, prepare for the repairs and order their space. So yeah, that's, that's the, the summary, the, uh, the 
the solution. And in this next slide, um, I'm just showing you how the solution is organized. You've got your masters there, which could be your electric motors, your gearboxes, your pumps, your compressors, and whatever. And these are the assets that we'd like to monitor. And uh, at the next level, uh, you've got your, your sensors, which you will install on the uh, on, on, on your assets. You've got the motor scan sensor there, which I've spoken about. Then we've got another sensor, which I'll speak about uh, a little later on, which is called the wake scan 100. And then we've got also another sensor, which is called the wake scan 101. I'll explain to you the differences later on. But then we've got the gateways. Uh, which sit on the edge of the of the IoT platform, collecting data and sending data to the IoT platform. We've got the next 2000 gateway. We've got the next 1000 gateway. The remaining sensors there, uh, the wake scan 1000, 1001, and 4000 uh, for monitoring of VMTs, the motors, and the characters respectively. At the next level, uh, this is the management level we've spoken about. We've seen it. But what you have there on the, on, the, on, the, on the management level, you've got access to your uh, like your graphs. You can do vibration analysis. And lately, with the uh, later version of the sensor, you can um, have, have what we call the, the app digital notify. What happens with this is uh, if, you, if you've downloaded the app, you can actually can get notifications on the condition of your asset on your app as well, and not only on the, um, on, on the, on, on, on the IoT platform. You can do maintenance management, asset um, timeline, data acquisition, asset create uh, using the app work scan. The next level, um, we, we've also seen it in the previous, is, is, is where we've got our modules, we've got the specialist module, and we've, uh, we've got the excellent module. I've spoken about this, and I will speak about this uh, later on. And obviously, maybe one thing that I need to mention here is that this solution is under constant development. Um, I'd like to, at this stage, play you a video that basically uh, shows you some of the uh, things that I've spoken about. It's a problem when you put it in a memory stick and you're trying to run it. There's no way the better file is. So when you compile it, you can find the same folder. The problem is that the presentation is busy. Yeah. Um, but maybe, Johan, we can leave the, we can go on to the next slide. Okay. So if you could not play, um, but there are the, uh, I've got the motor scan sensor there at the top, and the wake scan 100 and the wake scan 101. You can see on that machine uh, the way it is installed, the motor scan sensor uh, is installed on that machine already. See that problem again. Okay. And this is the data that we collect from the uh, from the assets, if it is the motor or whatever it is. So we, we collect data on vibration in three passes uh, up to 16 Gs at 820 Hz. This is for the motor scan and um, up to 13.3 kHz for the wake scan uh, on one. What this means is that um, the roll of frequency or the spectrum of, 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 of the frequency for the motor scan, the minus 3 GP roll of frequency is at 820 Hz. And for the wake scan, 100 and 101, the roll of frequency is at uh, 13.3 kilohertz. Then we also collect data on external vibration. The vibration of the machine is due to something else in the environment of the machine. The surface temperature, um, we measure it from minus 40 degrees to 135, running time, and rotational speed. Okay, 
So let's briefly have a look at the gateway itself. What does it do? It, um, we, we say here that it performs sensor reading autonomously via Bluetooth, and it uploads selected uh, fast Fourier transform frequencies to the MFM club. I will actually show you some of the FFT frequencies later on um, in the, one of my uh, presentations, uh, one of my slides. Uh, it stores data uh, and, so, you know, even during all offline periods, and it connects the, uh, for the motor scan sensor, you can see the distance between the, the, the sensor itself and the great gateway should be about 30 meters line of sight, assuming that there is no other, um, you know, hindrance in between. And then for the wake scan, uh, 2000, that distance is 100 meters. Um, and when they were sent data to the, to the cloud. The difference between the two is that uh, for the for the X1000, the first entry that you see there, although you can, you know, associate it with about 100 sensors, but the distance, as you can see, between the sensors is utterly limited. For the X2000, the other gateway, the distance it has improved to about 100 meters, but you can only associate it with uh, about uh, 40 sensors. Um, in the next slide, uh, we will briefly look at the, the the management level of the software, uh, which we've spoken about. <laughs> so the management uh, software, as I've said, does asset online management and data storage and uh, uh, maintenance reports, uh, reports and intuitive dashboards. We have got to the next slide. And then these are some of the functions of the management layer that I was speaking about. Receive data from weak scans. Um, you can do asset operation condition. That is, you can actually set uh, the level at which you want to get a notification on whether the asset is normal and or whether there is an alert coming from there or whether it is in critical mode. That you can set up yourself. There are guidelines, lines, of course, but um, most people with experience with their own machines, they know how to but they will know how to set the levels where they should get these notifications. So those are some of the param parameters that uh, that we, we can have access to on the management level. And um, in this slide, you'll see some of the reports the way they are organized. Just quickly. Uh, in, in the first report that came up, they actually shows, and you'll see it later on, it just shows the layouts, like the flow plan, if, if it is effective or wherever uh, your scan sensors are installed. Then the second report that you saw there is like a summary of all the assets that in that particular uh, in that particular location. Now, when you when a user has been given access to the data on the IoT platform, this is basically the first uh, uh, you know what you will see on the on the IoT platform. You will get a summary in map in, in in the form of a map of all the uh, the plants that you have access to. In this case, this uh, this is this is me. Um, it shows there that I've got access to those plants in Brazil, in Cape Town, and in Jobek, and I've got a total. Uh, there's a total of 138 assets in all these plants. The remember the green um, the green color there. If it's a notification, it says that the the uh, the asset is in the asset, the asset is okay. The yellow is a warning coming from the asset, and um, the red means the asset is in a critical mode. Now, immediately when you see this, when you see this summary, I think uh, the first thing that you're going to know is what exactly is happening to those assets which are in critical mode. And in the next slide. Um, I tell deep well, in this slide, basically this is just the map, uh, the flow plan. But in the next slide, uh, I delve deep into some of the assets that appear there to be in critical mode. The first, well, it's actually one asset. Because as you can see there, the name of the asset is the same, which is red. But it's it's an engine. Then there's also the scan engine, which is actually a motor scan sensor. So in the next slide, uh, then I delve deep again to find out what exactly 
uh, is happening in this asset, which is a critical moment. The message that you get there, and this message, by the way, is coming from the module that I say it is called the, the specialist module. So the, the module now is actually telling you that uh, in vibration, the limit of 6.8 millimeters per second in the actual uh, axis has been exceeded, and it's actually measured 7.137. That's why you say that this uh, asset is a critical mode. And then um, uh, I delved deeper again to have a look at some of the plots uh, coming from this particular asset. And this is the plot of, it shows you basically the plot of vibra vibration and temperature as well in the three axes. The beauty with this, uh, because you can't see it unfortunately, but you can select and deselect any one of the curves that you want to display there, whether it is one for temperature, whether it is uh, vibration in the Y or the X or the Z. The, the, the Z axis, so you get G cell into there, so that you, you get one graph and having an idea of how the vibration has been going on. If you just go back to the previous slide, uh, if you look at the, one, the picture of the motor scan sensor there, if you click on those three dots at the top, then you will get the following uh, information that you see in the next slide. It actually opens as a, a, a menu for you, but what I've done on this menu, I have chosen the FFT frequencies that have been uploaded to the uh, to the MFM platform, and on this MF, uh, uh, FFT uh, plot, you can see that there were some spikes on certain days there. This is not really quite informative. It just shows that there was a spike on a certain date. But if you now go on to any one of those single points, those FFT points at the top, which is what I would do now, uh, if you just choose one, just yeah, I've chosen the last one. You can just go there you want to see the message that is coming from there. You can see uh, this, there's a message coming from there regarding this particular uh, this particular FMT point. So I then I then in the next slide I then go to into this particular one point, and this is the plot that you get that you get. You get a plot of the frequency uh, on the horizontal axis and the amplitude um, of the vibration on the vertical axis. Um, um, the beauty of this as well is that you can actually zoom onto any one of those of those points if you want to see to have more information uh, on what is happening there. But what I've what I've done, if you look on the right hand side there, where some menus there, if you choose, if you to choose that that arrow there, if you choose that arrow, it opens up a menu where you can get um, you can actually place your case up on any one of those points, it shows you the side bands and the frequencies on the side bands. And if you choose harmonic analysis, if you put your case up on the fundamental frequency, it shows you all the harmonics of, of vibration. I think that actually appears in my next slide. You can go to the next slide. Yeah, as you can see, what I did there is um, I zoomed onto one of the spikes. Um, and um, what I did there, um, I, I, I put my uh, harmonic of course, the fundamental frequency would be at the frequency at which the machine is rated. Uh, but then once you place your case there on the fundamental frequency, then it shows you the rest of the harmonics. As you can see there, the I think it is the third harmonic. There's a problem there. That's one that just got the highest spike. Um, and even if you go to the table below there, if you go, go to the third harmonic, you can see the amplitudes of vibration in all the dances. They are extremely high. That's exactly why this machine is critical mode, because you can see the vibrations there, uh, in particular of this harmonic, they are, they are, they are very high. This is a typical report that you can get from the MFM platform that you can generate. It's, it, it gives you a summary of all the assets that you have. As you can see on the left hand side, it tells you the number of modules, the number of drives, the number of gear boxes uh, that you have on your plant. And, um, uh, that report continues there. Um, it tells you the, the motors or whatever asset is what uh, the specialist module running on and so forth. Okay, okay, well. So in this case, um, well, I was going to speak about what we have spoken about the specialist. Um, but perhaps we can go on to the next slide. Um, this was supposed to be a video. We can just skip it. Um, just going to the next slide. Uh, this is just a summary of what the specialist module does. Um, those are some of the things that you get from the specialist.
this module in Kuro. Then uh, the specialist module has got a sub module. I would say two sub modules where you can do consumption analysis um, and you can also do diagnostic analysis. The diagnostic analysis module is actually the one that told us in the previous asset that you saw that the, the module or whatever asset it is, it was in a critical mode. That's the one that does the in-depth analysis of the problem that is on the on the, on the, on the asset. And the consumption module allows you to, um, to estimate the energy consumption on your model when you are running your model uh, uh, over, uh, over, over 24 hours, over a month, and so on and so forth. It actually also, it is also helpful in the sense that it can also help, help you to, to size your module because if, for example, you've got a very large module and you only use, um, you know, according to your consumption that you're calculating for this module, you only use a very small amount of your energy, then there's no point in having a large module in your, um, in your, in your installation. Get, get it. And this is the diagnostic module that I was speaking about. Um, that's the advanced vibration analysis for auto and balance, misalignment, hearing failure, and external vibration. And those are some of the plots that you can get from the diagnostic module. So that was the uh, specialist module. Uh, the last module that I'd like to speak about is called the exchange module. Um, I think we can go, go on to the next slide. The exchange model module allows data exchange between the MFU and third party, making it possible for data storage at the customer database and integration with third party systems. I spoke about the, the scan that we are on your MEMS, which are software which are used in the warehouses. But this is how it this how this is made possible. You've got your gateway. You've got your gateway linked to those sensors, reading data from those sensors, sending data to the cloud. And you're sitting there with your mobile device or with your PC. You can request data directly from the cloud using RESTful API uh, directly from the uh, cloud access. Or you can request for data from the gateway itself, still using RESTful API uh, from, from, from the gateway. But I must mention here that at this moment in time, WEG has implemented the part that you see where the part that they've implemented at this moment in time is, uh, is the one where you, sorry, let me just go back to the slide. Are you able to go back to the slide? The one that is in green, that's the, the part that is actually implemented at this moment in time. So, which means if you are going to require to have data uh, from, 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 from the cloud, then you've got to request it uh, using RESTful API. Um, uh, and cloud access, and not local access from the gateway itself. Finally, uh, when we look at the latest version of sensors that we have, what we have there is we've got the, the WakeScan 100 and the WakeScan 101. What has improved in this case is that the you can you can change your batteries on the WakeScan 100, and on the WakeScan 101 um, you can. It comes with an adapter which you can plug onto the onto your main supply. Um, if that you can use that to power up the, the, the scan sensor itself. Okay. Next slide. Um, so we say here that the wake scan 101, it has got external power, um, but the measurement is still the same via the gateway uh, using Wi Fi uh, over 3G or 4G, or you are using an Ethernet cable. Well, what we mean here by using the Ethernet cable is that you can actually plug your, your gateway onto your existing network uh, via Ethernet to have access to, to the cloud. Then uh, what also is new um, is that we've got new technology called WakeSync. As you can see on that picture there, you can have more than one sensor on one asset or, you know, more than one asset. But what the WakeSync does is it obtains all the data coming from the from your assets three in this on this module, for example, and synchronizes all the data to the cloud. Um, then there is also what you call the wake sense. Uh, the wake sense um, actually what it does is it actually is capable of telling you the condition of your of your application of your peers. Um, and as you can see again, the PF curve is back. 
But at that point on the PF curve, uh, that's 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 where we sit with the wet sands, and it can actually tell you uh, the condition of your of the duplication of your PMs. Then looking at the the data in the X2000, spoken about this 40 sensors, 100 meters from the sensor, um, but still it functions the same way as the previous gateway, which is the X1000. Well, those are like details. I think we are done. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, uh, we had problems with the with the presentation. That was not anticipated. But thank you for, for listening and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Take a few questions, so don't disappear. Ah. Um, so anyone around the table have any questions? Prof's hand is up. Yes, ma'am. Um, previous research, this committee has done has shown that about 75% of all uh, motor failures were mechanical in nature with their alignment and bearing problems. Um, what has changed um, given that you now have mechanical failures less than 40% of what has changed in the meantime? What do you think has changed? That information is based on the research that you saw. There is a link to that research. Uh, my main point in bringing that up was not to say the feelings, but was to bring a foundation uh, on the MFM uh, condition based maintenance. The figures, like I said earlier on, they could be totally different. But this is actually based on that particular research. So if you look at that link, it says inverted field numbers. Hmm. So inverted the victim stays. I think the numbers has changed. Yes. Those are over my numbers in the cat or failures that was based on that specific research. Mm -hmm. But we all, I think we all agree that mechanical failure is still by far the main cause of the failure. That would be to 90 percent. And also, mechanical failures are electrical failures are consequential to mechanical failures. Yeah. Oh, somebody just says electrical failure has the sort of consequence. <laughs> It was also the video that um, I see state the one for three acres, but that can also be reduced by botanical. Yes, it is. It's a great show. But look, um, like I said earlier on, uh, the essence uh, on that particular slide was not to say that you need to present accurate figures. The essence was to sort of a foundation for the need of condition based maintenance. That's a follow-up question uh, about your sensors. Um, it is a non-intrusive sensor, so it's not measuring current. How can you then estimate the load on the machine that measure current or voltage? And I can yeah, help, and you can Wait, let me know. I'll answer that one. The sensor itself measures what? Measure the around it and it also measures the running speed. So in the frequency spectrum, you can see based on one times. So once you enter the motor data in the beginning into the sensor, the sensor can see running speed versus the rate of speed. And then calculate the load or estimate the load for that point. There's no you're 100% correct. It doesn't measure amplitude and it doesn't measure all because there's no connections between the sensor and the motors. But based on the surrounding speed, the slip that I said, it estimates that load. Okay. Do okay. you have a problem? No. Yeah, I just need some letters. It may not be to deal with the false alarms. Is to have one or more motors installed. Is that correct? Say again? You may not need to deal with pulse alarm. Let's say one module is giving you a pulse alarm. We get two modules. They help to alleviate that problem. Is it correct? 
Are you speaking in relation to this? Yes, like in one example. Yes. You, you said we can have three modules from one machine. The three three sensors. Yes. It's not yes. a machine. Yes. 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 You use them to mitigate on those uh, type of problems. Definitely. Um, the works what the works in sync does. It actually knows what data is coming from which sensor, and based on that data, it can give you a warning uh, related to that particular sensor. Um, and also, it synchronizes both the data. The synchronization basically is to make sure that the data coming from the three sensors um, it goes to to the to the MFM platform uh, all at once, not like in in, in buckets. Yes, but. If you don't mind, if I can add to that, normally you have one sense of code, but if you want to use the, the sense um, option, which gives you a location track, and you put more than one sense, why? Because the closer your sensor is to the hearing, the better the accuracy of the detection of implication issues. Why would you want to do that? Sometimes a motor has a bigger hearing in the front, and in the back, you have different duplication intervals, but you know on the plant, it increase both here at the same time, even though there's different increasing intervals. So by fitting more than one sensor closer to the bearings, you have more accurate control of the duplication condition. Okay. In this sense, we, we can use more than one sensor on one. Where my one sensor increases your reports to the other one. In case, for instance, instrument implementation frequency, because it can get this for it. Yeah, yeah, but if you add to that as well, remember the tool, if created by a gateway, is doing continuous monitoring. Mm -hmm. So you are going to start to build a chain over a period of time. So, in order to avoid a false alarm, it's going to be comparing to the chain permanently. Yes. So the, the chance of having a false alarm is actually reduced because you are changing permanently 24 hours, 365 days a day. A, a, a sense of failure rather than to have a false alarm. Yeah, yeah so um, with AI, one of the Concerns is uh, cyber security. So, what are some of the security features or standards that the uh, system complies with? Uh, okay. Um, the, the data in the cloud, even when you request it, um, it actually complies. Actually, we use transport layer security, which is your ordinary uh, security that you use on the on the, on the internet, and that is very really, that has been proven to be very secure. So, there's really um, if nobody can hack into your data. Um, and on the side of the of, of the sensor where you collect the data from from the sensor onto the onto the IoT cloud. And you saw the 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 communication between the the, the sensor and the and the gateway, which uses NQTT, uh, which is also another protocol uh, with high high end security. So your data is, is, is really secure. But I mean also if you are in a factory you're going to allow someone to just walk in with their mobile device and try to get data from the sensors. That's, that's, that's something else. But between the sensor and the gateway itself, it's a MQT security. And on the other side, from the cloud to, to the user, uh, we're using transport layer security. Do you ever then need to connect into the plants network? If you don't want to send them to the plants network, you don't need a direct information to the plant itself. There's no no to add that. Well, thing to add to that, but when we say AI, the AI software is built into the system. It's not a live connection to some AI that to be. So it's a closed loop. It's not a, it is no live connection for AI to connect to a series. The AI is built into the system. So it's closed loop. Yes. Yeah. 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 I've got uh, two questions. The first one is, what is the solution for bipedal variants? And then the second question is, uh, can you do migration analysis during that up with that yarn? If not, what is the minimum state of time that you need for bipedal variants? 
So, for white length of year, so if you only measure frequency for the population on the length of displacement, because uh, there is no minimum inside. And also, so you have a logic to compensate for that? Yes. And it's only on the surface of the year in house. Temperature and population. During the ramp up and the ramp down the sensor is not built for that. The sensor is built to take measurements at least every 10 seconds. 10 seconds. Yeah. To have stable information that you create a trend. The main idea of this solution is to create a trend to determine when the trend is changed rather than doing um, condition based monitoring. Uh, by the same. So it's not good for the potential frequency. No. I think just to add to that, what, what, what happens to well is when you could connect connecting the system, you have to enter in the serial number of the equipment that the sensor is installed or the serial number of the model. And the cloud will automatically pull the data and the bearing information of what that machine was built with to then understand its right method. Because that serial number has a lot of materials, etc., attached to it, which now it can automatically pick up. This has angular content, or this has white metal, this has rolling element, so that you can then change correctly. And for the machines that doesn't have serial numbers. You have all, all the run, or you don't have the weight motor, for example. You can then obtain the motor basic rating information from a different supplier and enter it in manual. So it's not that you must have it. So, question. Yes. Do you have any uh, have you guys this week done any research using this in the field? I mean, about raw, raw data stating. This product has improved motor life. Yes, yeah, it was. It was in the field. Field. On, on the sensor itself, um, I think tests that have been done in the lab uh, at different work uh, have shown that the sensor is 92%. But you haven't got any data from clients who use the current use of it to give you feedback to say it's um, more prompt and now running more efficiently. It's 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 right. Right. The new here is about that sensor that we're trying to implement as well. Well, it doesn't have to be from South Africa, it can be from other plants overseas. I'm going to have to give us a reference to that. It's not the performance of it. We, I, I can get that data from, from, from other plants outside, but I've not seen that here's other that is relatively uh, presenting it in, in, in this platform for the best time. And then in most cases, what we have done is we have put this sensor out and it's from testing uh, what should be the response from our customers. Now, it's a customer's existing condition managing the equipment in place. Well, how will he benefit from this? Because a lot of customers do have existing equipment in place to monitor the, the assets. So how does this differentiate from the current? I agree. Um, some customers, but. Awesome. No, Look, a lot of customers with critical equipment already had uh, sensors in place for a higher level of to come once a month to take some readings, make a report. What this does is it you don't have to install this if you already have a system. Yeah. Okay, but if you would like to, you can add it on top. Mm -hmm. You can compare the two if you buy. Yeah. Um, what we have seen seen in the past is Installing this in your critical equipment will be the first thing, right? Because that's we don't specifically want to pay. Yeah. Yeah. It is much cheaper to do something like this than paying someone to come back here and take the measurements. I think the power of the big Scott is the internal dynamics, as you all know, the needs that can then go a lot of history yes. and the diagnosis damage from the management market. It's probably the key. Yeah. A lot of systems out there are done by IT people, and basically it's just a measurement device. There's no diagnostics, or we now you've got more diagnostics and the damage to be referred to. 
you know, that's, that's one. And the second is also that condition monitoring systems are expensive and you monitor key pieces of equipment. With a system like this, it gives you the functionality of connecting up to 100 electric motors to one gateway and monitor your entire plant instead of just the critical applications at a much smaller cost than doing a live feed from each machine. So where, I don't know, 110 kilowatts is not seen as being critical enough to spend the money to do continuous condition monitoring, you can now do it on that 110 for free by paying for the more critical one because you just connect to the same link. Then that's, that gives you that advantage. Yes. I think there was the challenge to keep the equipment running. Experience mm -hmm. in the it is the base downtown. People get in the town by letting you have access. They just get me running. And because the system doesn't stop, you can't operate as if the system gets put into operation with like a sense. And you're going to fight to get the sensors back in. So that's the practicality. There's no buying from the top from management. It will the system degrades after you unfortunately. So that's our challenge for the future is to try and get the industry to actually adapt these type of systems that are beneficial to them and understand that the plant will run, but yes, you're going to lose information in the future. Hey, thanks, I think we should also appreciate this. This is some new technology that has been presented to us. So we'd like to probably get some follow up on where in terms of implementation, how it's worked, but I think that would be fair to, uh, to bring up. Um, I can also appreciate what you said. Uh, I don't think it's invasive technology. So we don't have to really do it. You can get this on running plans. So from what I understand, you can get this up and running on running plans. So you don't need any advantages. So that's already an upside to something like this. Um, so last, the last question is from myself. Okay. Second last question. <laughs> um, can any of the way guys tell us what parameters the type of different monitor with the, the scan device? And then second, um, how long is the battery lost? Okay. If, if, is it a built-in battery? In other words, one change it, you've got to throw it away and put on a new sensor. How does it work? So the first sensor, the motor scan sensor, the battery lasts three years, the default settings. If you want to measure more regularly, it could last maybe one year. Right? If you want to measure less regularly, it can only last up to five years. But the second sensor that we showed data uh, UX can under that one you can replace the buttons. And this makes it maybe more easier for someone. Even if though you have the old sensor, which you cannot replace the battery, you can replace the sensor. You that it has a function on the app when you just continue that one, add the new one, and it just continue on with the thread. So the thread information is not linked to the sensor, it's linked to the asset. So so exchanging sensors should not be an issue. Got some hands in there. Yes, uh, yeah, I've got a question from uh, Dion. Uh, Dion, you can speak. Hi, good day, everyone. Um, on the slides, I saw that this uh, sensor is not uh, suitable for variable speed drives. Uh, is there anything else you guys would suggest? That was an, an error. It is 100% suitable for motors with driven by DSD for variable speed drives. Okay, that's fine. Um, then just another question. Uh, due to our UV radiation here in SA. I just want to know how are resistant are these uh, units to solar radiation? Uh, what type of light can we expect out of them before I need to start replacing them? Well, that's, that's a brilliant question. We haven't, I don't think we have tested it like that, but, the, but it's designed to set outside in the sun. So, Dion, I don't know the answer to that one. In fact, um, all we can say is that this sensor is certified for all conditions. And this certification is there. But I can say we, we haven't really installed it in place where we can say we can prove what he's asking about. Yeah, look also for UV. The, the whole sensor is encapsulated. Yeah. Okay. You can't open it if you want to. So the only thing that can get damaged is the 
outside surface of the sensor. I don't see that as a huge concern, but that's fine. And the outside the casing is IP66 weighted. But I just wanted to say, um, going back too much, what you must have been on uh, the parameters. Oh, okay. You, you, you can go. I wanted to speak about the, uh, the, the battery. Because on the MFM platform itself, you can also monitor the level of the battery when it is going down. You can plan to replace it. Yeah, so you get an indication on the app or on the platform itself. It will tell you, like the number one, two, three, four, this battery is start going flat. Plan to change the sensor or plan to change the battery or plan to charge the battery. Maybe it's different. Uh, I don't know what you would do. No, uh, no, no, no. Yesterday, we proceeded because uh, when I first uh, had a look at the sensor, particularly the, the latest version, uh, I looked around. Uh, to see where we can buy the replacement battery. Yes. At this moment in time, I couldn't identify any supplier where we could get a replacement battery. But in our discussion yesterday uh, with the presidents, they are willing to supply us with the batteries as well. They have to. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, Joanne has another question. Uh, yes, uh, I've got a question from Mr. Merwenya, and then again after that, Dion has another question. Um, over to you, Mr. Merwenya. Oh yeah, I just wanted to to find out: is there any conditional limit to where these motors can can be installed? Because some of the environments are acidic. Some they've got so much concentrate looking at our environment here in Zambia. Thank you. That's quite for the one area. Okay. Not too sure about this. Then I think people have access to all the mm -hmm. So so much, please. So much, please. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any further questions, um, Mr. Merwenya? For now, nothing. Okay, thank you very much. And then over to D D Dion. Hi, right, thanks. Just a final question uh, about corrosive environments that have at least been covered. Just the um, maximum continuous heat tolerance that these uh, units can um, tolerate. Um, I've Work at a smelter, so uh, heat is part of a, uh, uh, how would I put it, just a part of the formula here. Yeah? Um, what, are, what are we looking at for maximum continuous heat tolerance on these units before they start failing? It measures up to 136 degrees Celsius ambient continuously. Is not to say that the sensor itself, yeah, if it is exposed to a certain level of heat, how long will it last? Yeah. I think that's this question. Yeah, that is the question, but remember, yes. the sensor is continuously rated to work at an ambient of 136. So, as a minimum, 136 degrees is where it can function. It obviously has to be a little bit higher rated than that to measure that temperature, but that that would be the answer. I guess we could double check that and come back with, yeah. uh, with the exact temperature that it can constantly work in. Anything anyone else? Uh, I think I'll, nobody else, Chair. Okay, probably the same number. This is the same. Yeah, you know, you can answer my second question, but not the first one. Yeah, the parameters that it measures is so the vibration, the temperature. I think you're having a slide. Yeah, we, uh, you had it on the slide. You can just put it up and then. In the meantime, we'll be getting that slide. But it's yeah. My question is more on the human resources side. This is South Africa. And in terms of the skills needed, are you guys saying that you just apply a sensor to the machine? Is it stay like those who can go away? But what happens to you? I just feel great. 
in, in terms of resources, you need someone to now the essential onto the asset, which is your motor. You have to grow one hole in the motor. Normally, a motor is made this this So it's not easy. Uh, easy to wait for the motor to grow is easily into cost you. But once it's perfect, you need to set it up. It's done through the app. It's really easy. Everyone uses apps nowadays. Once it's set up, the information is continuous. There's no the only resource then needed is who must the app tell when it's important the presentation. So you can send someone to go and have a look. So typically to be the foreman or the section leader for that area where it's installed, you'll get a message saying pump one, two, three, it's got a uh, very defect or it's running water than family, send someone to check. So this, you don't need to train lots and lots of resources out of the system. So your completion elements are not really needed. No. So, yeah. no, I'm just trying to say that. The analysis is done automatically. Yeah. If the, if yeah, the software tells you that there's a correct problem at that time, you still may need some study. What's causing the virus? And to understand, if it's a standard person to be high, is it just something that is required lubrication? Uh, you know, there's different levels and degrees of severity depending on what the failure is. So you need someone who understands it, that if a machine standard vibration is 2.5 millimeters per second, and this is now vibration uh, vibrating at 20. There's something serious going on. And then what the effect of that failure would be. Any other questions from anyone? Yes, I was that part of the bridge, right? You can be a ghost to the main part. You can use my summer part of the market. I think there's a hundred question. You can move the question of the. Yeah, I don't think we need to ask. Them. Yeah, I think I don't think that's a realistic question to ask. The last question for myself. So I see this relies a lot on trending. Right? That's in the main thing. Yeah. But what do you consider as a period of trending until your data becomes a right? So in, in our case, we do have this more thing that is each about understanding the machines again, or we can really subsidize how flat is happening. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for the uh, presentation. Um, well done. We really appreciate that. Just going to have to answer the first question. So for us, the premise is that it Yeah. Thank you. It seems that the. Uh, the slide is not uh, yeah, it's not showing the same But it measures vibration in feed plants. Yeah. It measures the surface temperature. Mm -hmm. It also measures that ambient temperature. It heats up. It measures flux. So the magnetic flux around the yeah. It calculates around speed based on the fundamental frequency. So, yeah. um, it is a green axis. Still more present surface temperature up to 135. One second. is a rotational speed. Rotational speed is not measured. It's calculated based on the speed for one time. And the running time is when this magnetic flux are on the machine. They know it's on. So you use the, the, the actual speed to estimate the loading. Okay. So what other derived um, parameters can you then get from those measurements? So yeah. we, from those measurements, we can also establish duplication yeah. condition. Also, uh, forcing frequencies generated inside of gearing. It's inner race, outer race, public element. Based on the size of gearing that's there, it's gearing at the forcing frequency. So if we're speaking up the amplitude, Around those frequencies, you can actually tell this bearing has a problem, the inner race bearing of the polar or the bearing of And the last one that they calculate or estimate is the load, they link it to the running time, which gives you energy over time or energy is kilowatt hours that this machine is using over a month or a year. Yeah, so estimated operational cost and sizing to an extent. 
based on what load you're running at, if you should maybe consider reducing or increasing your motor size, which is going to help you with energy consumption over time. What about currents, unbalanced currents, over voltages? It doesn't measure any of those. No electrical current. No, no electrical. No electrical connection. It's a standalone mechanically fitted sensor, so you can't get those results. <clears throat> hey, Bob, is your first uh, question answered as the last question? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the presentation. As well, Dad. I think uh, looking at new technologies and seeing what's out there and how people are trying to apply the things is uh, very important for us as a community. I think there's a very good feedback from people online and people around the table. Thank you guys for having us here. That's really good. Uh, I think we're ready to close, and uh, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. I'd also like to uh, thank all the people online. It was a really good session. Uh, I'm my place. Um, please drive safely to where you're going, and uh, that's it for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hamish. Yeah, I